Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's special webinar on the topic, as you can see on the screen here, charities, the ACNC and COVID-19. Whoops, I just lost the screen. There we go. Um, thanks for joining us. We hope to get through uh, a fair bit of information today and hope to provide you with um, some useful bits and pieces that you can take back to your charity operations. Um, just before we do get into the, the content proper, just introduce myself. My name is Matt Crichton. I'm from the ACNC's education team and joining me to present today's webinar is uh, Rachel Smith, who's also from the ACNC. Morning or afternoon, Rachel. Oh, hi, Matt. Um, I'm the director of our advice services, education and public affairs teams. And also Mel, Melinda Knight from the ATO. Hello, Mel. Oh, hi, Matt. Um, so I'm currently acting as director in our not-for-profit centres advice and endorsement area. Excellent. So lots of expertise for you all today. And we are suitably isolated in our own homes at the moment doing this online. So if there's any interesting noises that you hear in the background, <laughs> that may explain it. Okay, just before we do get into the topic today, just a few bits of admin to run through. If you're having trouble with the audio, um, it may be worth dialing into the webinar. You can listen to it as, it's a, as if it was a phone call. If you use the phone number, that should have come through in the confirmation email you received upon registering. Also, we've got quite a, we've got a full house today. So we've got, um, we expect a lot of questions to come through. We'll try our best to answer questions as they come through. You can ask them using the GoToWebinar navigation panel on your screen. And we have a few colleagues answering questions. We've got Bree, Karen and Chris. Um, but um, if we don't get around to answering your question, we will um, endeavour to do so later on via email. And just on the questions, it may be worth um, keeping them general in nature if you can. I suppose if something's really specific, it may be worth sending us a more detailed email or, or getting in touch with the tax office, depending on the topic of the, of the question. But nonetheless, we'll do our best to answer what we can, given that the uh, topic is subject to much movement over the past few days. We'll answer with the, 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 um, our best knowledge at this moment. And... Um, we are recording this session, so if, if you miss out on or if you have to leave halfway through, never fear. The, the recording of the session in full will be published on our website as soon as we're done. Um, okay. Oh, and also, just on the questions, we will have a Q&A session, uh, section at the end of the webinar. And um, if, if you wanted to hold off until then to answer your questions, we, we can um, field some of them um, live then. Okay, um, let's have a look at what we're going to cover today. We'll do it um, in basically three sections. We'll have a look at the COVID-19 um, situation as far as the ACNC operations go and what it's, how it's affected the ACNC. We'll then have a look at the tax implications that it has for charities. And finally, we'll do our best in the third section to give you some advice and I suppose some tips or, or general information of how best to manage the upcoming challenges for your charity. Okay, as is the case with many organisations, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected some of the ACNC services too. So, so we do wanna first and foremost, thank you for your um, understanding and patience in this tricky time. Rachel, would you be able to give us just an overview of um, some of the changes that have come about as a result for the ACNC? Sure, Matt. Uh, so the ACNC Commissioner has extended the annual information statement deadline for all charities that have a due date between the 12th of March and 30th of August. The due date for those annual information statements is now currently the 31st of August. If we need to, we will re review that date again um, as the situation unfolds. Uh, we're still accepting and processing applications for registrations, but for organisations that might be part th way through an application and do not wish to proceed due to the uncertainty at the moment, they can withdraw applications and reapply at any time. Um, but we are still processing registration applications. As of today, we have had to um, 
close the contact centre phones. We've we've had some difficulty getting our telephone system working remotely as we're wanting to move staff to working from home more. We're continuing to work through those issues, but all the staff are online responding to inquiries. So continue to send us any questions you have via our online form from the website. If staff, staff will assess those questions and as they come in and if they need to, they will reach out and contact people to work through those issues. We met some other things that we're still working our way through. We met with um, our sector advisory groups on Friday via a teleconference to hear from them what they believe the key issues were and concerns, um, particularly relating to compliance with the governance standards at the moment. So there's, there's three key issues that we are currently working our way through and I, we hope to update with additional advice on our website in the next couple of days. Um, we've had um, reports that for charities that work overseas, they are having some, likely to have some challenges um, with overseas partners in relation to external conduct standards in terms of meeting the partner reporting requirements because they are also struggling with the current crisis. Um, so that's one that we are looking at. We have had reports of cases of government agencies asking charities to undertake activities which might assist in the response of COVID-19, but are outside of their purposes. Now, Governance Standard 1 does require charities to only undertake activities in line with their stated purposes. We're looking at how we might deal with that issue from a regulatory perspective. Um, with understanding that uh, in order to make the law work, it would require regulation changes and it's highly unlikely that that would happen quickly enough. So we're just trying to work through operationally how we might deal with that issue as well. Um, and we've also had, um, you know, a lot of reports on the impact of this crisis on charities' ability to do fundraising and the consequence of that for some is their ability to remain solvent um, will increasingly become an issue. Governance Standard 5 requires charities to take reasonable steps to ensure that their responsible persons do not allow a charity to trade whilst insolvent. So that again, because it's in the regulations, we're looking at how we can um, support charities with that issue from an operational perspective. So those three things, um, keep an eye on our, our COVID-19 webpage and we'll add some additional advice to that. In, it should be, I'd hope, in the next 48 hours. Thanks, Matt. Excellent, yep. And um, this extends to um, other regulators too. We've been in touch with various state-based regulators, which I, I suppose is mostly relevant for incorporated associations. And we've found that um, there have been a variety of uh, announcements and extensions um, on that front too, Rachel. Yeah, so um, incorporating associations requirements around things like holding AGM varies from state to state. Um, most states have now confirmed with us how they will approach the, the issue of AGMs for incorporated association. And we've added links to information for all the states that we know about to our COVID webpage directly to their information. And we'll update this as um, I think the only ones we have outstanding at the moment are the Northern Territory and Tasmania. We'll update those as soon as we have that information. From the point of view of the ACNC, Governance Standard 2 requires that charities are accountable to members, but does not explicitly require them to hold AGMs. So our advice on that is we don't expect charities to hold AGMs if it's not safe to do so. But you do need to check what your governing document will and will not allow you to do and any requirements from other regulators depending on your legal structure. Um, and in addition, if you make decisions that are different to how you would normally 
run your AGM, it's important to record mm -hmm. those decisions um, so that so that that information has been put down on paper somewhere or electronically, of course. Yep, good advice. And we will touch on some of these issues a bit later on too, but that's an important one to keep in mind. And for the charities that take the company structure, ASIC too has an announce, has um, uh, announced an extension of sorts. Yeah, so ASIC has, has um, stated that we'll take no action if AGMs are postponed for two months. And at the moment, that means to the end of July. Um, I'd expect that they will revise that advice as well if they need to. Um, and they have, they also um, have promoted holding AGMs using appropriate technology. And I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later on as well. There's yeah, also a link to ASIC's guidance on our COVID-19 webpage too. Yes, there is. And I think it'll um, uh, take that, that one we've got down at the bottom. Is It's a fairly long one. That's straight to the ASIC site. But yeah, as Rachel mentioned, on the ACNC's website, we've got a collection of all of these links for other regulators, the state ones and ASIC there. So actually, I might just go back for you all there. If you wanted to have a look, it's acnc.gov.au forward slash COVID-19. You'll find all the links there. <clears throat> OK. Um, Oh, and there it is again. It was on the next page. Okay, <laughs> forward slash COVID nineteen is where you find all the information. Now, we'll have a uh, we'll come back to some of the charity operation stuff later on. But I'm going to throw to Mel from the ATO, who's going to take us through some of the tax implications of all of this. And I'm sure there are a lot of you here that have come specifically for this section because um, government announcements in recent days have uh, meant that this is uh, pretty relevant for a lot of organisations. Mel, would you be able to give us an overview or run through of all the, all the things that have changed in the past few days? Sure. Um, so I might just quickly, um, as Rachel did, just outline to you very quickly about what services are available to you at the moment. So we still are operating our not-for-profit premium information line, which the number will be at the end of our slides. Um, our staff are working from home. Um, so, so we are, while trying to maintain service, I think, um, you know, there may be times when um, you might need to wait a little bit longer and have a little bit of patience with us, but we will be able to get to you. Um, at the end of the slides too, there'll be some information for, for other things. Um, I guess it's important to kind of note that the ATO is doing everything um, possible to assist both businesses um, and not-for-profits and charities to deal with whatever situations are coming up. Um, so we also have some information available on our website about things like um, if you need to um, ask for a deferral of payment on activity statements um, or deferral for lodgement, all that information is there and I'll give you a phone number to, to go to. Our information on our ATO website is being updated pretty much on a daily basis. So um, the, the page that I give you at the end is a really good place to go to kind of um, get, get the most recent and up-to-date information. So thanks, Matt. We might just move on to the next sure. thing. So I guess um, the, the thing that everyone's probably here to hear about today, um, the government um, has announced some measures um, to help businesses um, deal with these economic impacts um, that, that we've, we've seen with the um, COVID-19. So the, the, the one measure that does um, have, have some impact and, and will provide some relief for charities is the boosting cash flow for employers measure. Um, so the, this measure is um, for small to medium businesses and not-for-profit organisations, including charities um, that employ staff. So we might just move on. So in, in a nutshell, there are two sets of cash flow boosts that will be delivered from the 28th of April to support employers to retain employees. Um, and these boosts will be... Um, between a minimum of $20,000 up to a maximum of $100,000 for eligible charities. And the way that they'll be delivered is through credits in the activity statement system and, and it'll be available to you when you lodge your activity statements. So they're not a, a payment um, as such, but it is actually a credit that is applied to your activity statement. So in effect, you'll you know, be paying less on your activity statement according to the credit 
or will um, receive a refund if you're in a credit situation. Um, so the eligibility that we've got on screen there, um, key things, so we're actually just talking about charities here, small businesses and other not-for-profits have some different eligibility requirements, but for charities that are in Employers, you may be eligible if you're registered with the ACNC and you have an aggregated annual turnover of under 50 million and you have about that. Oh, I think we're having a few sound yeah. challenges. We have a, having a few sound challenges there, but yeah. um, I suppose as the, as the um, eligibility requirements are there on the screen, it's important that these do reflect the, the charities that are employers, um, as Mill mentioned. Um, small businesses and other not-for-profits have different eligibility requirements. If, if we get Mel back, she can she can say hello to us. And uh, can, can, can you can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm so sorry, my phone That's cut right. in and um, technology. Thank you. Sure, um, no problem. So <laughs> we're going over the eligibility requirements that you mentioned are for charities. It, it might be worth just to touch on these. Um, just yes. quickly, I suppose people have had a few seconds to um, pour over them on the screen. Sure. So the first one, you are registered with the ACNC. Um, the second, that you have an aggregated annual turnover of under 50 million. And that point there, I will say that is um, something that the ATO is actually working through at the moment to provide some very clear advice on what that means. Um, I can't actually provide that to you today, but we'll be, you know, updating our website with that. Um, and the third one there is that you've made eligible payments that are subject to withholding, even if the amount withheld was zero. So an eligible payment is really any payment that you're making to an employee or a director um, where there is like a, a, a withholding obligation, even if the payment, you know, the, 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 um, the worker or the employee is under the tax-free threshold and you don't actually withhold anything. Right. And actually, before we do move on, Mel, I think that's worth a point worth reiterating is that much of this stuff is still being worked through, right? So, so we're going to come up against some um, uh, ideas or concessions or whatnot, even with other regulators too, and the ACC that we don't actually yeah. have full answers for at the moment. That's right. And our our web page with this um, information goes into a lot more detail, obviously, than I'm covering today. So it will kind of talk to you about what those eligible payments include. Um, you can get some more information there. Okay, so the next key point is that if your charity is eligible, you do not have to apply separately. So um, you don't need to ring up, you don't need to ask us when you're going to get your payment. All you need to do is lodge your activity statement as normal and I'll be going over in the next few slides when, when those um, things were there, but you do not need to contact us separately. So to receive your boost, your charity needs to lodge its monthly March activity statement or its March quarterly activity statement. Okay, so they're the key things. You need to just lodge your statement as normal. Um, now these credits that were, you know, will be calculated, we posted to your account by the ATO from the 28th of April. And this is a really important point. Even if you do lodge with us earlier, you will not receive that credit before the 28th of April. So again, um, calling us and asking when it's going to be delivered, it's actually not, it will not be coming any sooner than the 28th of April. And also important note, for charities that have been granted a deferral, say if you've, you had, uh, you're in a bushfire affected um, area and you've been granted a deferral of lodgement for your March activity statement, you can still take advantage of that deferred date and we'll calculate your, bu your boost after that. Thanks. Um, okay, so we're just going to talk about the two boosts. So we kind of talk about these as like the initial cash flow boost and then the second cash flow boost. So the initial one is going to be delivered as a credit in your activity statement, you know, as of the 28th of April 2020. Um, if you lodge early, you won't receive the cash flow boost before this date. On the next slide. Oh, yeah. 
sorry, there we go. Yep. Great. So we, I just outlined there the quarters that this initial cash flow boost um, uh, applies to if you're reporting to us quarterly um, and then also the monthly periods that it applies to. So you can see there it's March and June quarters and if you're monthly, it's March, April, May and June. Um, now, the additional cash flow boost, so this is the second boost. Basically, if you've received your initial cash flow boost, then you'll be entitled to receive the, the second cash flow boost. And this second one will be delivered for the periods June to September, um, equal to the amount that you received to start with. And you either get it in two or four instalments, depending on whether you're quarterly or monthly. In the next slide, I've just kind of put some information there about how we calculate this. Now, obviously, this is really brief information for everybody, but we have some more detailed information on our website and then also some examples that kind of work through. So you'll be able to um, to work through the process to, to calculate how much you'll be entitled to receive. So in a nutshell, it's based on the amount of PAYG withholding that you're reporting on your monthly or quarterly March activity statement. So you'll receive a, a credit that's equal to 100% of the amount withheld up to a maximum of $50,000. Now there'll be a minimum credit of $10,000 and that's for those charities that might have a lower amount of withholding. So you're not, you're paying wages, but you're not actually withholding anything. So you would be eligible to receive that minimum $10,000. And the examples on our website do go through that process. Thanks, Matt. Yep. Okay, so for monthly lodges, they get a credit that that's equal to three times the rate in the March VAT. So obviously quarterly lodges are lodging a whole quarter's worth of wages and the monthly ones are only reporting their wages for March. So we'll times that by three and that will be your amount that you'll receive in that period. And the total of all initial cash flow boosts across all the relevant periods cannot exceed the maximum of 50,000. So that will be the maximum you'd be entitled to. So minimum 10, maximum 50. And then with the additional cash flow boost, this one is really easy to calculate. Basically, they take all of the amounts that you were eligible to receive in that first cash flow boost and they... Um, they kind of give that back to you again. So they don't need to recap, they just calculate the amount you received in that first wave. Um, okay, so then just here's some um, just information for you. Um, so as we said, we've got some COVID-19 support information available on ato.gov.au. Um, you'll probably see as soon as you hit the landing page on ato.gov.au that there is a link to COVID-19. So there's that QC code there that you can also search, which is 61775. That takes you to a landing page um, where you can access information if you need help to meet your tax obligations. Um, at the moment, we have an ATO emergency support info line, which is that 1800 806 218. Now, as you can imagine, things are changing all the time. So this is the number for you to call if you need to defer a payment or a lodgement of any of your obligations. That may change. So please check the website before you need to do anything just to make sure you're ringing the right number. And then we also have our dedicated not-for-profit advice line, which is our 1300 130 248. As you mentioned, our staff, and there's, there's only a handful of them, they are all still working and they're working from home and receiving calls um, there. They'll be able to help you with anything that you need to know about like concessions, you know, your endorsements, DGR endorsement tax concessions. We're still processing those as they come through from new registrations from the ACNC as well. Um, so we'll be doing our very best to kind of help you through this time. Um, over to you, Matt. Thanks, Mel. Yeah, lots of great information there, but it's, it's worth reiterating the point that much of this is new and, and people are coming to terms with how it's going to affect their organisation. So 
um, keep your eye on the website there. I, I did a search of QC61775 earlier and yeah, it pops up first search results. So that's one way of getting there. And just on that last point, that SID in brackets refers to that being Sydney time. It's not like it's restricted to Sydney residents or anything like that. 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Sydney time. Okay, um, we'll move on. We'll have a look at some uh, tips, advice, um, information and resources for managing your charity through this challenging time. So we have a few, we'll go through them in, in different stages and we hope to be able to provide you with some uh, some useful information and ideas. Of course, as, as we've said a number of times, we may not have all the answers to every query at the moment as we're all trying to work through this, but we'll do our best to provide you with um, some stuff that may help shape your thinking over the immediate short term at least. Okay, the first one here, and, and we don't mean to sound trite about this, but for, first and foremost um, is to keep safe and try and minimise the spread. So that that does mean respect social distancing recommendations, um, stay home if you can. Um, the, the bottom line is that that this will save lives. Um, Rachel, um, welcome you back to the webinar here. Some other points that people should keep in mind on this one? Sure, Matt. Um, it was interesting, a friend of mine the other day said to me they think that we should be calling it physical distancing, not social distancing, because even though we have to keep a physical distance, keeping connected with people is particularly important at this time. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, it is important, I think, that people really keep up to date with the advice that's being provided by both the, the Commonwealth and state governments and health authorities because it continues to change quite rapidly. Um, and the advice for specifics, there's some variation between what's happening in specific states depending on the situation in individual states. Now just on to Thanks, some man. charity operations, um, this is going to look very different for different charities, of course. There are charities of much bigger size than others and, and doing so many different things. It, it's not going to affect everyone uniformly. Um, so if we have a look at just some of the broader aspects, Rachel, what, um, just uh, yeah, from a, from a broad perspective, what are some of the things a charity um, should start thinking about at this time? Well, look, I think uh, we'll see significant variability in how COVID-19 impacts across the sector. Some charities are probably going to find themselves overwhelmed with demand as the number of Australians in health or financial distress increases. Uh, and particularly those, those charities that rely on volunteers may also face particular challenges. Uh, those ones that obviously that provide health services, um, emergency relief, and, and specifically those ones that were already working to provide relief around um, bushfire affected communities are probably going to find themselves with yet another layer of um, demand to try and work their way through. Uh, it may also be that um, for some charities delivering services, they'll be hindered by the work and safety concerns for their staff and volunteers, particularly if their insurance, they're, like their volunteer insurance, doesn't cover pandemics. Others that provide services that involve bringing people together, like we've already seen with the arts sector, churches and those that provide social activity services may no, no longer be able to deliver some, of, some or all of those services due to the restrictions that have come in. And some may really struggle to remain viable if their funding sources have dried up and they're not able to hold fundraising events. Um, and we may find that for some charities, they take the decision to close their doors temporarily in order to preserve their organisation to um, reopen once the crisis has passed. Uh, obviously, the responsible people for each charity are going to need to consider their, their own charity's position for both the short and long-term impacts of this crisis. Um, they'll need to look at their financial and operational risk and their capacity to adapt to the changed environment. Um, and there may be some pretty tough decisions that people have to make. So I'd encourage people to take the time to work through with their charities, their individual situation and decide what is the best approach for them and what is best for their start organisation, staff, volunteers and beneficiaries at this time. 
yeah, some important decisions to be made over the next few weeks. And um, Mel did a great job explaining some of this, but we might uh, may reiterate the importance of just considering the government support. Of course, this is not necessarily going to, um, you know, be, be in a complete saviour for all charities, but it's certainly going to help keep some charities going through the time and it should be considered as uh, some additional support, I suppose. Um, okay, Mel, uh, and just uh, if you're still there, <laughs> and just to um, uh, give it the listeners an idea, which is the best way that people can contact the ATO if if they do need some help? Is is it by um, phone, or um, is it uh, better via email? Say if people are having to wait long time on the phone. Um, I, I think the best place at the moment is to check our website and then see whether or not the information on there like can assist you. Oh. The the number that's being provided at the moment for that emergency assistance line is really to help people that need to defer lodgements and payments to make sure okay. that, you know, we've contacted in that respect. Um, I think that the, the general business line where, you know, if you need to update contacts and do things like that, that they are all experiencing high um, loads at the moment. Yeah. Um, and that's probably, you know, due to a number of things as well. And Auskey, you know, despite us, the, you know, the warnings that it was going to be switched off has has turned off as well as of the 27th of March. So people still need to kind of get their contacts organised. So I think the, the best thing to do is to visit the website, look at what you need to do and find the corresponding phone number to do that. Our not-for-profit information line, like we're here to help you with all of your concessions. Um, our staff staff you know can maybe direct you in the right place but that support is limited as well um so i just like might you really go to the website find out what you need to do and if there is an online facility to do it it'll you know, it'll direct you to do that um does that, does that help matt yeah yeah it does it does and i'll just yeah. take this, um, a moment here just to clarify the distinction between the ato and the acnc so the ato will be able to give you those answers specifically about the, the cash flow boosts and and other tax implications yeah. the acnc is about charity operations charity governance questions um charitable purposes activities reporting to the acnc that sort of thing so um uh, questions related to charity tax is not within the ACNC's remit, and we'll, we'll have to, you know, go via ATO resources on the website there. So just think that through before contacting either the ATO or the ACNC, just to make sure you're getting the right questions to the right people to give you the right answer, hopefully. Yeah, no, it's a good point. And I thought, I look, it, it is very frustrating as well if you're not sure where you need to go. So I think that's where our NFP line can actually help you. While we might not be able to do the functions of, you know, putting a deferral on your account or doing anything like that, we can direct you to the right area if you're unsure of that. Okay, we will move on a related topic, I suppose, here, just about charity finances, not necessarily the tax implications as much as just general finances. So, Rachel, I'll, I'll throw back to you. This is going to, you, you did mention it briefly in the outset there, but this is going to have significant effects on uh, charities' finances and this first point here about remaining solvent. What, what are some things that charities uh, may need to think about now? Uh, well, Matt, I, um, I think charities need to think about whether they have sufficient funds, obviously, to continue operating if some of their their funding sources have dried up. Um, yep. I'd keep a very close eye on our website for some additional information um, pending in the next day or so about advice about solvency that we're working through from a, a legal perspective, and I'd hope that we can provide that in the next day or two. Um, with regard to reserves, I mean, some charities do might ha have reserves that they've established as part of diversifying their financial resources, and they may be able to access those to carry them through short-term financial stress. Um, obviously, boards will need to be give careful consideration to what they can and can't do with reserves, because some funds may be set aside for specific purposes and may not be able to use be used for something other than what they were set aside for. Uh, so considering the conditions of any grants, for example, um, and working through 
um, what conversations you may need to have with grant bodies about if you're considering um, making use of those reserves. Yeah, that's a good point, and it's one that people should, uh, I suppose, take seriously. It's one that often can be overlooked. Um, just continuing on this, on liabilities, uh, what are some things charities, responsible persons, should be thinking about um, with regards to liabilities? I mean, I think um, charity boards need to review what their existing liabilities are and um, give some consideration to what financial support is available to them, either via um, government. So, for example, there's the, the information that Mel's provided in terms of what the Commonwealth is, government support is available. Each state government is also um, announcing a variety of support relevant to some organisations in their state. And again, we've got some links through the Money Smart website to, to what the state government's position are, is on these things. Um, and banks is the other one. Now, some charities might not realise that usually char a charity is classed as a business for banking purposes. So that means they might be eligible for the same support provided to businesses through their financial institutions. So <clears throat> it's worth contacting your bank to find out how they can help and whether they're, for example, example waiving interest payments or offering relief packages um, and also to check with your, your state government in terms of what sort of financial assistance they're offering. Okay, legal considerations are going to be a big one over the next <coughs> few weeks and months um, and there's quite a bit in this. We'll, we'll do our best to give you a broad overview but th this really is going to depend on the complexity and size of your obligation I suppose. Um, Rachel, what, what are some of the, the broader legal considerations that responsible people in a charity should be thinking about at this point? Um, so, for example, you know, a lot of charities have contractual obligations that they'll need to consider any consequences in terms of their contract, ter contract terms if their operations are um, impacted or they find they have to temporarily cease operations. Um, I'd suggest that board members consider getting out all the contracts their charities have um, with clients, government departments, other community organisations or businesses and give some thought to the potential impl implications of um, on those contracts if their operations change. Can they meet their obligations? Um, which ones might they not might they not be able to meet and sit down and speak with partners about how you you might agree to move forward. Um, Justice Connects Not-for-Profit Law has some great resources on con contractual responsibilities during the COVID-19 crisis um, and I see that there's a link to their website on that slide. Um, so uh, but giving not not forgetting to give some thought to those contracts is going to be really important. Yeah, and that's a good one. It's, it's worth checking out that web, uh, website. There's some really good information there, particularly if you, you you feel like you're sort of treading water in the middle of a vast ocean at the moment. That one's a good one to sort of uh, give you a bit of an anchor point and start thinking through this um, systematically. Um, legal considerations extends to employees too, and lots of charities do have employees. Um, what sort of things should the responsible persons be thinking about with regards to employees, Rachel? Sure, Matt. So, um, as we've discovered ourselves in the last couple of weeks, there's a significant resource goes into reorganising your operations to account for the new um, distancing requirements and, you know, trying to make it possible for people to work from home. Um, charities with employees are going to need to think about obviously how changing work arrangements affects their operations, um, any implications for leave arrangements, what type of leave are you going to make available to people depending on individual circumstances while the, while the COVID-19 crisis unfolds, um, what sort of working, arrange, working from home arrangements do you need to consider including obviously occupational health and safety, are people's work from home arrangements adequate for the short or, and or long term? Um, what sort of communication might you put in place to 
be able to keep your, if you're able to keep operating, to make sure that you stay connected with your employees and that you can still monitor the work that they're doing and still meet as many of your um, objectives as possible during these sort of difficult circumstances. Um, obviously, the, the, the package that Mel mentioned has particular implications for organisations that have employed staff. Um, and the Fair Work Ombudsman and Justice Connect not-for-profit law both also have good information on Australian workplace laws and COVID-19. And there are links to those organisations on the slide that you're looking at and also on our own web page. Yeah, and as um, many of you will have noticed, we're referring to the Fair Work Ombudsman rather than the Fair Word Ombudsman as listed in the dot points here. So. Um, that's funny, the D and the K aren't even near each other on a keyboard. Anyway, that should say the Fair Work Ombudsman. Um, but as Rachel mentioned, there's some really good uh, resources there to go through um, and at not, not for profit law at Justice Connect as well. Okay, and as we mentioned at the beginning, this is being recorded, so that error will be set in stone for all time now. <laughs> Let's move on to some obligations for charities, particularly with regards to ACNC registration. Now, record keeping is one that charities do have as an obligation to the ACNC, Rachel, and it's one that uh, we've received a few questions about recently. There's a little bit of angst about um, being able to keep records through this time, but it is a really important thing to do. Yes, yeah, so obviously keeping records of decisions the board makes in terms of any changes to operations that need to be made is going to be really important as well as, as um, ongoing record keeping in relation to financial expenditures, financial management and activities. Um, and giving some thought about how your charity will maintain records if everyone is working from home and they either can or can't access the, um, the organisation's IT systems and what you might put in place to ensure that you don't end up with significant gaps after the crisis has passed so that whether you then need to do whatever reporting you need to do whether it be to the ACNC to the Australian Tax Office to funding bodies that you're still able to do that so thinking through might might be some procedures that you can put in place to assist your staff teams to continue to keep those records that are important for your organisation um, you know, there's a lot of scope in the digital space using email, shared document tools that can really help with this. Um, and they don't have to be, obviously, records don't have to be any specific format or style. They just need to be easy to find and either in English or easily translated into English so that your organisation's um, documentation of its operations continues during this period. Yeah, and the point about the digital options is a really good one. Th think about how you can do that, because just to cover those potential gaps in your regular record keeping practices, it's it's um, uh, an important consideration in this time, because we do expect there to be lots of dis crucial decisions made and, and changes come out of the next few months for lots of charities. Another one that's um, been the subject of many questions for us at the ACNC, and we have touched on it a little bit at the beginning with regards to other regulators, but AGMs and other meetings, Rachel, um, they're, they're, uh, lots of people in charities are worried about uh, not meeting obligations on these fronts. Yep. So um, after people have checked what they're able to do through whether that's ASIC or the state incorporated body, if your regulator and rules in your governing document allow you to hold an AGM remotely using technology, I'm just going to go through some of the things that you might need to think about. And we'll also put together um, a bit of a sort of tip sheet on this and we'll put it up on our website again in the next day or so. Yep. So when thinking about if you're able to run um, either audio or, or video meetings, um, give some thought to which of those two options might work for you. How will you ensure um, that there's validation of members' entitlement to participate and vote if you're doing remote meetings? Will a virtual, you know, will a virtual meeting exclude some of your key stakeholders? 
um, who are less familiar with uh, or have limited access to technology. Um, you know, will the if you decide to use a particular technology, can people access it via any common devices? For example, at the moment I'm participating in this webinar on my iPad. Um, other people might be on a laptop or a desktop or an iPhone. It's important to consult with key stakeholders to ensure they're comfortable with what's being proposed, particularly in the case of virtual meetings. Um, give some consideration to whether the cost of a, a, a video meeting is proportionate for your organisation. Um, how will you deal with voting? We'll use a ballot, a paper-based ballot by post or an online um, platform that allows members to vote, ask questions and participate electronically in real time. Um, you know, for example, I know the, um, there's, a, there's an app called Link Vote that was originally designed for ASX companies. I'm going, to, I'm going to have a bit of a look at that later and see whether it's something that not-for-profits can use as well. It seems to be a free app that you can download. So there are technologies out there that enable um, this remote kind of meeting arrangement as well. Uh, will the, the technology you choose accommodate your charity's specific requirements? And again, that's around voting, um, or if you, for example, are wanting to show slide presentations at your meetings, uh, what processes will be in place to ensure that the technology is secure enough for your circumstances and effective and works seamlessly without interruption for people as much as that is possible with technology? Uh, how will you ensure that you keep appropriate records of the meeting, both in terms of the decisions you make to hold a meeting differently to how you might normally do it, but also during the meeting if you choose to hold one electronically? How will questions and answers be managed and what protocols will you need to put in place if you've got a large number of people online? For example, you might ask people to submit questions in advance of the meeting to help manage those, or you could do it through an online message board during the meeting or both, obviously. Um, who will review the questions and facilitate board responses? So what people do you need to have in place to run something like this. We've got a number of people, uh, I think we've got, apart from Matt and Mel and I, we've got three or four people in the background helping us run this webinar. Uh, make sure you've got, you've got pl allow plenty of time to test technology and if you need to do a bit of a rehearsal for the AGM, we had a bit of a practice go yesterday to make sure ours was gonna work with everyone in different locations. Um, if you're sending notices out to people, make sure there's clear instructions on how to access, speak and vote at the meeting electronically. Um, it should also make it clear that all votes will be taken on a poll, uh, you know, and how that, how voting is going to happen, whether you're going to do it via a paper ballot or via an electronic um, process. Um, what, what if anything, can you put in place for stakeholders who might need assistance using technology before or after or at the meeting? Um, are you able to have someone you know on available on the phone to help people if they get a bit stuck? That may or may not be possible. If you've already issued your notices for a physical meeting, um, but your um, rules and regulators allow for an online meeting. Um, you might need to, you'll need to announce this and you might need to put a post, contact everyone, put a post on your website to update those changes. Um, so they're just some of the things I was thinking through in relation to this and we'll, we'll develop a bit of a tip sheet for people on this and add it to our website. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, yeah, we kept um, we kept the um, stuff on the screen relatively um, small, but there are lots of things that fall out of this and lots of considerations for the responsible people of a charity. But but also it's, many of these are, are sort of small things that you can overcome and, and set up ways to um, to not allow them to turn into trouble. So we, we don't want to um, make it seem like a bigger task than it is, but it's, um, it's certainly, there are certainly some things that um, will come out of on embracing the online meeting that charities, responsible people and charities will need to think about. Um, okay, we'll get on to some activities, programs and 
operations now because this is going to have um, some real effects on the actual work that charities are doing and it may change the direction for lots of charities in in a number of ways um, Rachel just thinking through this what what are some of the things that um, uh, charities responsible people should keep in mind when when thinking about how their activities and and whatever they do is going to um, be shaped over the next few months sure um, it's obviously going to be very significantly depending on individual charity circumstances but um, you know, just just the resources involved in an organisation positioning itself to continue operating in the current environment are quite significant from establishing working home from arrangements, policies, procedures, to implementing distancing requirements for staff and clients. For example, we um, moved fairly quickly to a situation where we had only half the staff in the contact centre in the office on any given day and the other rotated them because their desks were too close together and we couldn't have people sitting right next to each other. Um, managing changes in service demands is obviously another one. Um, some charities might find that they need to reduce the size of their operations or cut some activities if they can't be run with the the current um, requirements to manage the, the current health crisis. Um, is there opportunity co to collaborate with other organisations? You know, the charity sector is extraordinarily innovative and it might be that some of your contacts have some really good ideas in terms of how they've managed, how they're managing this situation. Um, is there way to come, ways to come together to pool resources or knowledge to continue doing as much of the work that you do as possible. Um, the, you know, people might, I've heard, we've heard situations where organisations are reducing staff shifts or hours in order to um, preserve some of their, their resources, um, but obviously you also need to consider the legal implications of those decisions. And again, um, fair work and not-for-profit law offer some really good advice in that area. Yeah, and we'll have those links for you again, uh, show up in a little bit and in a follow-up email after this webinar. But just on activities too, um, you mentioned briefly about uh, using funds for different purposes earlier, Rachel. Activities fall into a similar category in that um, th there may be a temptation for a charity to do something completely different um, to what they've been set up to achieve. Uh, responsible people of a charity need to be wary of this sort of situation too, don't they? Yeah. Um, Matt, as I mentioned, I think at the start, the governance standards require that people operate within their charitable purpose. Um, I'm not going to say a lot about this one because we. this is one of the ones that we're hoping to be able to provide some additional advice to people on our website. We, our legal team are just working through um, how we might um, deal with this one given the current circumstances. But at this stage, charities just need to be mindful of um, continuing to operate within, the, within their purposes and as set out in their governing documents. Yep, and um, just helping charities through this time, policies and written processes are going to help greatly in, in certain aspects. Um, now, it may be that charities, well, we would hope that charities have many of these policies already written and many procedures to govern um, some of the things that'll pop up. But of course, there may be some charities that don't or that their policies don't quite extend to the, circum to the circumstances that they'll find themselves in over the next few weeks. So what are some of the um, policies they should be thinking about or the maybe adjustments or extensions to policies and written processes that may that you imagine may pop up? I mean, as we've found ourselves, we've had to develop a whole new policy document around um, staff working from home in the current circumstances. Um, we've had to give consideration to how we deal with leave, um, depending on pe individuals' personal circumstances, whether their children's schools are still open, if they're needing to care for, um, you know, have caring responsibilities with um, sick family members, if they become unwell themselves, um, 
for charities is obviously also the issue of volunteer management and how you keep your volunteers' um, health and safety in mind. Uh, and, and really it's looking at what are all the organisational policies you have that you may need to look at again with a COVID-19 lens. Um, yep. Are there specific things that we need to make some adjustments to because of this particular circumstance for the term of its, uh, as this situation unfolds? And we've got on the screen there a reference to our community, Save Our Sector. It's um, a, a page, I suppose, a, a broader campaign that our community has set up in, in response to the COVID-19 crisis. And they've got a whole bunch of templates, uh, policies, written processes, advice on that sort of thing. And it's worth having a look there. So if you take that website, again, we'll provide this in the link in the follow-up email as well. So you don't need to jot it down now, but do a search for community directors save our sector and you'll find some great resources there too now this is a key one we're getting towards the end everyone i know we've taken up a lot of your time this afternoon we really appreciate the the engagement that you're still with us after um close to an hour but we've just got a couple more bits to go fundraising is a big one rachel now we've had uh, this has a couple of aspects to it i suppose many fundraising events and the ones that have had to have been cancelled um in light of this and then also the the underlying problems that come for charities with the lack of uh, funds. So we'll start on the events one first. Um, what should charities be thinking about um, events they either had to cancel or will have to cancel and or, or they plan to run? Yeah, look, I mean, the event cancellation one's been a huge for charities, in ter both in terms of managing that process itself, but also their, obviously their revenue. Um, charities are going to need to think about whether they have to give um, refunds for tickets. Per, I've had one situation myself where a charity, um, you know, made a request as to whether we would um, consider donating the, the cost of the ticket to the charity to enable them to help sustain them through this, this period. Um, uh, you know, postponing events, um, what arrangements do you need to come in, come to with venues, guests and other people that might be involved in any particular events um, and how you're going to communicate that to those all those people that have an interest in your, your fundraising. Yeah, and the communication aspect's really important. So whatever path you choose to go down, you've got to really make that clear and make sure that the people involved do know uh, what's going on. As we say here on the screen, just to break things up, it is vital that your charity communicates with supporters about uh, changes to anything, events or, or campaigns. But but just on campaigns now, Rachel, this is something that charities are going to have to really rethink. Almost, um, you know, go back to square one because we um, we don't have the um, ability to do things in person anymore. Um, so it's something that uh, charities are going to have to take on board and become even more innovative. Although I do mention yeah. that, um, I do note that we might have the same uh, slide for this one. So I'll, I'll let you run with it, uh, Rachel. There are a few oh. points to make and people can yeah. pay attention to your voice rather than the slide. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, obviously the face to, for most people, the face-to-face -face fundraising events is, is not an option at this particular point in time. So people are needing to turn to look at what online platforms there are that they might engage with. There's quite a few apps that have been set up over the years to help um, raise funds for charities. So now might be the time for those to become more active. Um, you know, what use can you make of social media and other forms of media to, to encourage people to um, provide online um, support to your organisations and how you might encourage people to do that? Um, something that's worth looking into as well, the Australian Communities Foundation and Philanthropy of Australia have come together to provide a national funding platform to coordinate the philanthropic response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there's a link on our webpage to that and you can go on and register your funding needs on that website. So they're trying to really support this current situation by helping connect donors and charities um, needs and wants through that platform to help keep the sector going. Thanks, Matt. Yep, and, and just finally, before we do come to a, a bit of a wrap up, using your networks is, is really important. Um, 
there's a lot of expertise and knowledge in the charity sector on a wide range of topics and uh, people in charities are often um, very willing to share experiences and, and expertise so it, it's important to reach out to those you know and um, consider your your um, your own community in in trying to help you get through this that's right Matt Net networks are really important though it may be much more via electronic means rather than um, um, face to face as well now that we can only um, be in public with one other person in Victoria. Um, so give some thought to how you're going to connect with your networks. Uh, you know, the, sector, the sector's got a great history of innovation and of working together to resolve um, really challenging situations and, you know, invent new amazing ways to deliver various types of services and um, social policy. So I'd really be getting your heads together at a respectable distance with your, your counterparts <laughs> and your networks and talking about what are some of the ways that we might be able to get through this and continue to support our, our beneficiaries and keep our organisations going through this time. Yeah, there, there is no shame in reaching out and asking. It's really, in many respects, in facing many of these challenges, it's the first step. Reach out and ask. Um, you know, in a sense, the sector's all in this together, as we all are. So um, use your networks as best you can. Okay, that's uh, sort of the end of our formal presentation today. We'll get on to some questions, but we just wanted to provide you with an overview of the resources and, and um, links and whatnot that will help you out that we did mention today. So the ATO's website there, um, you'll see a link to the uh, COVID page on the home page, but also if you wanted to search QC61775 in the search bar on the ATO's website, you'll come up with um, the page with lots of the information there. Our community has some great resources as well as not-for-profit law at Justice Connect, we mentioned a few times. Now, CPA Australia has um, some uh, really good information about financial reporting. They've even got some case studies that you can have a look through. So it's worth um, jumping onto their homepage too, which has uh, a link to COVID-19 resources. Uh, similarly, the Australian Institute of Company Directors has some uh, stuff that may be of use for uh, people on the board of charities. And of course, on the health aspects, uh, check the updated advice on all the websites for federal and state or territory health departments. And again, we've got them listed on our page at acnc.gov.au forward slash COVID-19 if you wanted to go there. Now, um, we have run over time, so we're just going to make this really quick. We've got a couple of um, couple of questions for uh, to address that may help people. Mel, we're going to start with you. A couple of uh, quite a few ATO um, specific questions, um, and and just before we do get into it, we have received a flood of questions that we're trying to get through. Again, we will uh, endeavour to get back to you later via email if we don't get to you during the broadcast of the webinar. And there are some that are just so specific, it would you would benefit from speaking directly to, um, in many cases, the ATO, but in some cases, the ACNC about your particular charity circumstances. So if that's the case, we may recommend that course of action for you uh, rather than a, a, a response here. But nonetheless, we'll, we'll push on with a couple of questions. Um, now, Mel, with, uh, are you there? You are? I don't want to ask a question if we can't hear. If we can't hear Mel, but um, uh, oh yeah, we can hear you through some some IT robot noises. But um, we'll, we'll see if we can go. So we've had a question about the cash flow boost. Uh, I'll read it directly. If I hope the the asker doesn't mind. Um, will the cash flow boost be received as a way to reimburse payroll rather than keep employees employed when they have no work due to the virus? Do you need um, me to repeat that? No, I don't see the question. Looks like we may be having a bit of trouble with your audio, Bill, um, but that's all right. We'll, um, what we'll do in the meantime, we've got a question for Rachel. Um, one's come through, you mentioned lots of things about uh, embracing online digital stuff and um, using apps and um, uh, for AGMs and whatnot. 
someone's asked whether it be appropriate for a charity to spend charity funds on uh, costs incurred with this sort of thing. Um, so if it means they have to, I don't know, buy an, buy a new laptop or provide someone with an iPad or or buy an app subscription to be able to do it, is is that a fair use of charity money? It's it really depends, Matt, on on what their um, expenditure policies are, and what their governing document and and organisational policies allow them to do. Yeah, that's really because that's really a board. Um, consideration is it a is it a good use of funds? Um, you know, if, is it is the expenditure something that the organ that would be of use to the organisation beyond the immediate crisis, or would you end up with a whole lot of stranded assets? Um, and I think I think that's that really is an operational decision that each organisation will need to make. Yep depending yeah, on right. their circumstances that's right and it may be that um and it may be that it is fine it may be that it's it's unreasonable but it's something that you have to consider within your charity's circumstances there isn't um necessarily an answer that applies to all um i think we might have mel back now so we might go back to that um that first question i asked do you need me to repeat it mel I, th I think we still may be getting the robot noises. Um, well, at least I am. Um, will the will the cash flow boost be received as a way to reimburse payroll rather than keep employees employed when they have no work due to the virus? Okay, looks like looks like we're going to have a bit of trouble there, but that, that's all right. Look, um, we will get back to um, everyone with their questions, and for the tax specific questions, we do encourage you to go to the tax website. Um, again, apolo apologies for the for the audio troubles at the moment, but um, we will provide those answers as best we can, and for any specific um, issues regarding tax and. A question such as this, for example, it may be worth um, going to the ATO's NFP line to uh, see what advice you've got. You can get there. Matt, I see there's a question there about the um, philanthropic initiative that I mentioned. I can I can confirm with people that the website is communityfoundation.org.au forward slash COVID hyphen nineteen. Um, and there is a link, if you scroll right to the bottom of our COVID-19 webpage, there is a hyperlink to that, that, there, that website there also. Great, thank you, Rachel. Okay, um, look, I think, I think we may have to wind it up there. I, I'd note that we've, we've taken you all well beyond the planned hour. We're into 1.07 now, and I imagine there'd be a few people looking at getting some lunch. Um, Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, as I've said, we're, we're going to uh, get back to you with all answers to your questions as best we can. But as we have mentioned throughout the webinar today, uh, much of this is new to us as, it is, as much as it is to all the charities involved. And we're trying to work through some of the details of some of the initiatives and, and measures that we've mentioned today. So um, there'll be more information coming out over the next you know, 24, 48 hours to a week or few weeks that you really should uh, keep keep abreast of. A couple of good ways to do that is checking our website acnc.gov.au as we mentioned a few times if you go forward slash COVID-19 as one word you'll, you'll find a page where we keep all the information there and also the ATO's information as well. Follow us on social media because um, we're, we're pretty active there and we will uh, post about many changes that affect charities in light of COVID-19 on all our social media channels too. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we did record this session. So we're going to publish this on our website and on our YouTube channel as soon as we've got it ready this afternoon. I'd expect that to be um, you know, up and published uh, very shortly. Once again, thank you everyone for your time. Uh, we do hope that 
you're able to manage the challenges that face everyone in the, over the next few weeks well. And we're here and the ATO is here to assist charities wherever we can. Thanks, Mel, for joining us. I hope your microphone can give us a farewell at least. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> That's all right. Thanks for joining us, Mel. Really appreciate the info from the ATO. And thank you, Rachel, uh, for all your information for charities from the ACNC. Thanks, Matt. Okay, thanks once again, everyone. And thanks to our colleagues, Bree, Karen and Chris for answering all your questions in the background. We're going to continue to do that for a little bit and get back to you by email if we can't right now. Thanks again, everyone. We appreciate your, your time today.